what do these images have in common? In the movie Bad Education, these four establishing shots are our first view into the town of Roslyn, New York, outside the walls of its high school. And there's something present in each of them, the American flag. In the first three shots, this is explicit. It's not a focal point of any shot, but if we look really close, we can see that each one contains at least three American flags. When the bus pulls away in the final shot, before bringing us inside the school, it may at first seem that the flag is now absent, but it isn't. The red, white, and blue color scheme of the flag is still very much there in the costumes of the students making their way into the building. I think it would be easy to brush this off as an arbitrary choice to lend the setting a consistent look. But this costuming accomplishes more than that. For one thing, the color palette lends a certain uniformity to the Roslyn community itself, a single identity that sets them apart from the unseen other. But it also acts as a stand-in for the American flag itself, and immediately stirs the image, or at least the facade, of an all-American school. And with that image come certain all-American values. You know, wealth, enrollment in Ivy League colleges, and white heteropatriarchy. That's something else we quickly learn about the students, parents, and staff. Nearly all of them are white. Even if we don't consciously realize it, by assembling a large group of people who look similar to each other, and dressing them all in a similar way, the film very quickly establishes an in-group. So, any character's divergence from this color pattern is something we should take note of because it might give us clues about whether or not they fit in with the group. First, though, let's take a look at who does fit in. Bad Education fictionalizes the real-life story of an embezzlement scheme, where, over a period of eight years, multiple school administrators siphoned a total of $11.2 million off the budget of the Roslyn Union Free School District. That's right, each year, on average, almost $1.5 million went missing without anyone noticing. And it's not just anywhere that that kind of money could go missing. Nassau County, where Roslyn is located, is consistently ranked as one of the wealthiest counties in the U.S., though they just can't seem to crack the top 10. And at the very beginning of the movie, we find Superintendent Frank Tassone in a very similar position. Along with school board president Bob Spicer, He's trying to get Roslyn School District to the number one spot in national public school rankings. A high ranking means higher property values, which means higher property taxes to fund the school's budget and line the pockets of the administrators like Bob and Frank. When we first meet Frank, he's in the middle of an elaborate grooming routine. It's almost like a religious ritual, and the angelic choir in the soundtrack underscores this. Framed from behind, Frank walks through the dark, barren hallways of the high school. He's dressed sharply, and the red, white, and blue of his tie matches the outfits of the school board members who greet him. During school hours, the student body makes up a massive wave of red, white, and blue too, and Frank is really in his element here. The Bulldogs. We might see a couple more neutral tones here and there for balance, but nobody sticks out too much. It's like one happy, homogenous little world. Right? The first real challenge to our red, white, and blue color scheme comes in the form of Assistant Superintendent Pam Gluckin's niece, Jenny. Pam very easily keeps pace with Frank's every whim, but Jenny is... less competent. Jenny screwed up some paperwork earlier. I'm saving her ass. So she doesn't seem to fit in as effortlessly. Not only is she a bit of a female himbo, I wish we had a word for that, but she's also dressed in this gaudy green outfit. In every respect, Jenny comes off looking a little less classy than everyone else. Then, just a few scenes later, we meet Rachel. Rachel is dressed in pretty neutral tones, so she doesn't immediately fit in, but she doesn't really stand out either. But there is something that gives her away. Well, two things. For one, Rachel isn't white. 
Apart from her dad, she's actually the only person of color we really see with a speaking role as part of the Roslyn community. And on top of that, Rachel's wearing this green backpack. See, while red, white, and blue tell us something about class in bad education, green is telling us more about wealth. And while those might appear to be the same thing, there is a difference. Class encompasses much more than wealth. It's also a set of behaviors and relationships that can be difficult to learn if you weren't born into them. Someone can amass a lot of wealth, but still not quite fit into the social class that should come with it. You know, like Elle Woods in Legally Blonde. So Rachel and Jenny aren't the only characters we see dressed in green. We also see Pam wearing this color while she's struggling to keep up appearances at a cookout where Jenny asks permission to borrow some more of the high school's money. Later, Pam's son Jim is shopping at Ace Hardware on Rosalind's dime, and he's dressed in a green overshirt. He's flaunting his wealth. You think I'm high value? But it's clearly an illusion. A hardware store employee dressed in red, white, and blue soon identifies him as an interloper, and alerts Bob Spicer to how the school's funds are being allocated. But it would be a mistake to think that these color roles are static. Once Rachel starts to catch on to the irregular allocations of the school's budget, her costumes change accordingly. She's gained the upper hand over Pam, so in their later interactions, her costumes are much more consistent with those of her wealthier peers. And similarly, The first time she talks to the editor of the school paper about her article, she's dressed in green, which reflects the power imbalance as he dismisses her research. Yeah, it's journalism. Our readers are 15. But once she has irrefutable evidence of fraud, the playing field is leveled, and now Rachel too wears red, white, and blue. But despite all of these shifting dynamics, she keeps her green backpack. Rachel's relationship to class and wealth is complicated. She comes from a wealthy enough background to live in Rosalind, but her father is now unemployed. Other characters are constantly reminding her that they know this. There's collateral damage. Right? You must know all about that. I know you're going through a lot at home. What's that supposed to mean? You know, just everything with your dad. They're reminding her that they have power over her because her position is precarious. She doesn't fit in the way everyone else does. Rachel isn't white and her dad isn't rich anymore. That's why even as Rachel gains the upper hand, her backpack is always there to tether her to her social background. I know I've referenced a few plot points already, but if you haven't seen the movie yet, I should warn you that there are more significant spoilers coming ahead. If that's going to bother you, I encourage you to go check out the movie and come back later, but there are so many small details in this movie that I personally think knowing the general story ahead of time doesn't really hurt. So with that out of the way, it turns out Rachel isn't the only character who doesn't exactly fit in. On looks alone, Frank Tassone seems to assimilate pretty well into the Rosalind community, despite his involvement in the embezzlement scheme. While Pam is implied to have come from a middle-class background and toiled her way into the upper crust... I I went to school for years to get degrees. I drove the bus, I did the steno pool, I did everything I had to. We don't know as much information about Frank's class origins. But it doesn't matter, because there's something else that alienates him from the suburban social hierarchy of Rosalind. Because Frank is gay. It's important to remember that bad education, like the real-life events that inspired it, takes place in 2003. This was over a decade before gay marriage would be federally recognized in the United States. Even in New York State, two men could not marry each other until 2011. It was a pretty drastically different social climate for gay people in the United States at this time. And Frank takes steps to hide his sexuality. In dialogue, it's only acknowledged through several layers of uncomfortable irony. That poor woman. She's nowhere near your type. Throughout his 30-year relationship and his entire life, 
Frank has been marginalized and made invisible by the precise all-American values that he strives to make Roslyn represent. For many audiences, I think Frank does an exceptional job of looking and acting the part of the perfect heterosexual superintendent. He's so convincing, in fact, that the movie's big M. Night Shyamalan twist is when Rachel discovers that not only was Frank complicit in the embezzling scheme, but that he was also an active participant. And that discovery is impossible to disentangle from her simultaneous discovery that Frank lives with another man. Apparently, everyone was happy to put up with Frank's dandy shtick as long as he was pulling up test scores and property values. But once he becomes a threat to the school's reputation, it marks him as another outsider. In a confrontation, Bob Spicer says to Frank, It's practically, it's an open secret nowadays with the way you're carrying on. The flashy suits, the cologne, the, the, the shit that you do in your face. They laugh at you. Frank is trying too hard. His wardrobe is perfect, but it's too perfect. What did you people do to us? Apart from his moments with Kyle, we never really see him waver from the tailored suits and the all-American color scheme the way that Pam, Jenny, and Rachel do, and even some of the other administrators do when they're put in positions of less power. That is, until the movie's very end. When we find Frank in prison, we don't see the stereotypical orange jumpsuits. Instead, the prisoners are wearing all green, because they are reduced to their most basic labor functions by the prison system. Previously, we've seen characters with green incorporated into their wardrobes, but now we see bodies completely engulfed in green. In this case, it's not that these people have wealth and are trying to broadcast that to those around them. No, these people literally are wealth. They generate wealth for somebody else against their will. Stripped of their humanity by the capitalist system, they represent nothing but their value as laborers. Over one million laborers in the American prison system who earn pennies an hour while generating billions of dollars in income for both public and private prisons. As we see Frank go through the mirror image of his earlier grooming ritual, his facade is completely broken down. Transferred from the empty halls of a high school into the crowded cells of the prison, everything is flipped on its head. Prison labor holds up our economy. It is a cornerstone of the manufacturing industry and companies from McDonald's to Whole Foods are propped up by cheap prison labor. But it's not convenient for us to see prisoners as human beings because that forces us to confront the reality that our economy requires that they live in inhumane conditions and earn sub-minimum wages. Then again, it was never convenient for the Roslyn parents to see their superintendent as a human being either. You don't want to see us as people because that is not convenient for you. You just leave us behind at will, never think about us again. Right? In a prison, this is taken to an exploitative extreme, but in the outside world, everyone is reduced to their class and the value of their labor too. And the costumes say it all. <laughs> 